years and just through some really unusual circumstances, uh, I, I've written a commentary on the entire Bible. I, I never really planned to do it. It was kind of surprising how it all worked out. That's not really relevant here. But, but the, the, the bottom line is just this, is that I, I think that I have a feel for the Bible itself and how the Bible makes a difference in daily life and in our relationship with God. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Tonight is going to be a little bit different. Because my sweet spot, my bread and butter, is opening up the Bible and teaching verse by verse through a passage. That's what I do. But tonight I'm really not going to do that. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about how we can connect with God and God connects with us through the scriptures. Uh, the, the gentleman in that video, I think, spoke something really eloquently. Something that in one way or another, I'm absolutely positive many of you can relate to. You can relate to this idea of having something of a thrilling, ecstatic relationship with God that then cools to some expect, extent, and then you have to see what goes with it after that. I mean, this is a very common thing. But let me tell you something. This is not just common in your relationship with God. Isn't this in how every, and man, I, I'm going to say something and I might regret that I said it, so are we recording this? Because I want plausible deniability if I, <laughs> if I say something I shouldn't say. It's like this in every romantic relationship. Now, I caution myself about relating our relationship with God with a romantic relationship. Because in some ways, it's nothing like a romantic relationship, but in other ways, it is. So, I mean, I, God forbid that I would imply that it is a romantic relationship in any ways that it isn't a romantic relationship. But, but there's some crossover there. There's some crossover. And, and listen, I want you to know that it is confirmed by both experience and science that this is how generally relationships work. I was talking to a biochemist once, and this guy was a wonderful believer, university professor, and he was telling me about the biochemical research that goes into understanding what happens in the brain of a man or a woman who falls in love. And literally, certain hormones, certain endorphins are released that put somebody in a thrill stage. They can become what some of us have experienced, and certainly you've seen it in other people, somewhat love-struck, love-sick. They're like on the top of the world. They can't think of anything except this person that they love. You know, everything's about them. Sometimes we associate with just kind of a young love, maybe a junior high or senior high kind of thing. But, but it goes on even to adult years, this kind of effect. Let me tell you something. There is a biochemical reason for all of that. Now, I know some of it has to do with socialization and culture as well, but there is, this biochemist was telling me, there is a biochemical explanation for that. But this is what they notice, is that they notice that that invariably fades. It always does. Biochemically it fades. And then it will transition into a different biochemical release that is more focused on bonding and long-term relationship. This idea of a rush of thrill in relationship followed by a, uh, a continued on um, bonding and more established rooted relationship, it has biochemical uh, origins within us. Matter of fact, I see my friend Becky over there. Becky, Dr. Jeff Schloss, Westmont, that's the guy who was telling me all about this. Have you ever heard him do his presentation on this? It's amazing, amazing. Now, here's the tricky part. It's always difficult in the transition from the one stage to the next stage. And you yourself know from maybe personal experience or looking at it from other people, that's where relationships often run aground. The transition from the one stage of the initial rush of relationship to the more established rooted stage. Listen, not only is that true in personal relationships, romantic relationships between men and women, you know that it's also true in our relationship with God. 
There is nothing wrong. There's everything right with that thrill of relationship that comes to somebody when they first come to Christ, when they first learn what it is to have a relationship with God, when they first understand that they're forgiven, when they first understand that they're in new relationship with God. Everything right about that. But, but, that stage often doesn't last forever. God never intends it to end, but to develop into something more rooted, more grounded. You're not in sin if you don't feel that same rush of relationship that you once had with the Lord. You're just not. But God intends it to mold into something more lasting and more beneficial for you with, I believe, the occasional rush of relationship renewed from time to time. Now, I believe that the Bible has a tremendous place in not only that initial relationship, but the deepening long-term relationship. And that's what I want to talk to you about here this evening, is how the Bible really helps us to meet God and to be with him. But I want to approach this maybe from a little bit kind of a different angle. It seems to me, and it's a little hard to prove this empirically. I could give you a little bit of survey and research data, but, but I, I can't give it all. It, it's just sort of a gut feeling that I and a lot of other people have. I, maybe I'll get your general take on this. I, I believe that now, in the 21st century, here we are in the year 2018, that generally speaking, those who are Christians read their Bibles less than they did 40, 50, 60 years ago. Do, do you think that's a true statement? Think so? Think that there's generally speaking less Bible reading among Christians today than there was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? It seems that way to me. And I kind of ask myself, why? What's behind that? What's going on with this? Now, I don't know about you, but... There's probably some people in this room that has had my same experience. I was raised in a nominally Roman Catholic home. Now, what do I mean by nominally Roman Catholic? Um, my parents weren't really into the Roman Catholic thing, but, and actually, I give my parents credit for this, because they weren't believers, but they felt like the kids should have some religious upbringing. I wish there was kind of more of that feeling in the culture. I wish more unbelievers today, parents, felt like, well, the kids need some kind of religious upbringing. We'll send them to something. And so we went to the Roman Catholic Church when I was a kid, and they made sure that I had my first communion. They made sure that I went to catechism. They made sure that I had my confirmation. But the idea behind my parents was, okay, once you have your confirmation, you're on your own. You can do whatever you want. We gave you your background. Now it's just up to you. In any regard... Some of you have heard about, I doubt if you've experienced it, but some of you have heard about this phenomenon in the Roman Catholic Church where priests used to tell people, don't you read the Bible. The priest will read the Bible and tell you what it says. Does anybody, I, I'm not asking, well, first of all, does anybody personally remember hearing those words? I'd be a little surprised. Was anybody person? okay, just one, a few, all right. But no doubt, if your parents were in the Roman Catholic, they heard that. And their grandparents were absolutely sure. This was a long-held tenant in the Roman Catholic Church. Don't you read the Bible. The priest will read the Bible and tell you what it says. You know what I find shocking about today's evangelical world? Is we've become just like that in practice. A lot of evangelical young people that I know, and older people as well. I wouldn't say young people. It's just evangelicals, period. And I use the word evangelical in this context for people basically just mean those who take their Christianity seriously. Those who take the Bible seriously and Christianity seriously. I find today that most of them, they want to go to a church where the pastor preaches the Bible. Maybe he doesn't preach it all that good. Maybe he teaches it really good. But they want to go to a church where the pastor preaches the Bible. That's important to them. But do they themselves read their Bible? Eh, maybe yes, maybe no. Isn't that funny? What the Roman Catholics used to tell people as a command, we have embraced by default. 
I'm not going to read the Bible. I want the pastor to read the Bible and tell me what it says. That's where we're at today. And I think it's kind of an interesting and a shocking thing. So, why? Why do people read their Bibles less today than before? And I want you to know, I'm going to give you, and don't worry about it, I'm going to work through this list fairly quickly. But I'm going to give you 12 reasons why. Actually, 14, because I'm going to give you a pre-reason and a post-reason. But I'm going to give you 12 or 14 reasons why I think people read their Bibles less today than before. But I want you to think through this list. Take notes on it if you want. By the way, I'm deliberately not putting up anything on the screen because I thought, let's just do it old school here tonight and I'll talk and hopefully you'll listen. If you want to write something down or take a note in your phone, you'll do that. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to see if you can help me come up with some ideas or reasons that I haven't thought of. Because I'm still working on this list. And I'm going to kind of crowdsource this tonight to see if you guys can help me expand this list even more. Okay? So work through the list with me and think if you can give me some reasons that go beyond it. Now, I said a 12-point list. Actually, it's 14 because I'm going to give you a pre-reason and a post-reason. The pre-reason is this is I'm going to completely take it off the table those who think the Bible's worthless. The Bible can't be trusted. That there's really nothing of value in the Bible. That idea is out there, but I'm really not going to consider that that serious list. Though, I find it fascinating how our culture embraces that idea. Not, not long ago, it was in June of this year, I uh, ran across something in my Twitter feed. Now, I don't follow this guy myself, but somebody I follow retweeted it. Uh, a fellow named Patton Oswalt. He's an actor. Anybody know this fellow, Patton Oswalt? Uh, if he's famous for anything, he was the voice of one of the characters in Ratatouille, that cartoon. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was the high point of his acting career or something like that. But he's an actor, kind of a smarty pants, and this is something that he tweeted, okay? Listen to this tweet carefully, all right? Here we go. June of this year. Quote, Dear people citing the Bible, it's a cool book with some wonderful passages, but it also has ghost sex and giants and super babies and demons. It's why we don't make laws based on Game of Thrones, My Little Pony, or Legend of Zelda. 55,000 retweets, 223,000 likes. And what's that all about? Let me read it to you one more time, in case it got by you. Dear people citing the Bible, it's a cool book with some wonderful passages, but it also has ghost sex and giants and super babies and demons. It's why we don't make laws based on Game of Thrones or My Little Pony or Legend of Zelda. Now, when I read that tweet, you know what my first reaction was? Look, it wasn't outrage. Who is this Patton Oswalt fellow? We must silence this man. <laughs> Who cares, man? You, you know what my reaction was? The first thing that came to my mind was the movie Princess Bride. Okay, you remember that guy? What was his name? Vizzini in Princess Bride? Um, you know, the bad guy. Do you guys know this movie? Okay, I mean, I know it's an old movie, but... It, wasn't, I wasn't old when it came out. Okay, Princess Bride, when he's going to do the battle of wits with the hero. What's the hero's name in the movie? Um, Wesley, that's right. He's going to do the battle of wits with Wesley. And he starts off by saying something like this. He goes, you've heard of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates? And Wesley says, yeah. And he says, morons, all of them. That's exactly what Patton Oswalt's doing. Because look, fella, Mr. Tweeter and voice of somebody on Ratatouille. Look, you may think I'm a moron for believing the Bible. Fine, whatever. Maybe I am. You know, I mean, you could, you could have a valid debate about that. But are you going to look me in the eye and say that guys like Augustine, Jerome, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, I mean, I could go on and on. These giants of intellect and academia throughout the centuries, you're going to look me square in the eye and say that all these giants who took the Bible seriously, that they're morons and you're the expert? Really? That you could just wave the Bible away saying, it's like My Little Pony or Game of Thrones or, or, uh, or Prisoner of Zelda. It's just, it's just some 
weird fantasy fairy tale. Again, the Bible has way too much credibility, way too many people of far greater intellect and brilliance than not only me, but any of you as well. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. But you, you can't just dismiss it away. That was my first reaction. He's just like that guy who's saying Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, morons, all of them. Here's my second reaction. And I always think this way when I have, see some smarty pants talk about the Bible like that. I think, okay, then Mr. Voice of Ratatouille there, although he wasn't the main character, some side character in the movie. Mr. Actor and Comedian, which I don't know, maybe his work's good, maybe it's not. I don't mean to demean the guy, but just say this. If the Bible is such a primitive, weird fantasy, then why don't you write something better? Go for it. Just write something better. You know, the Bible is by far the best-selling, most, most read book of all time. You write something better than the Bible, there's a lot of money in that, don't you think? Then just do it. There's a lot of fame and fortune in writing some. Then why don't you just sit down and give us something better than the Bible? It should be easy if it's just an irrelevant form of fiction. But when you phrase it in those terms, what do you say? Never. It's impossible for somebody to do something like that. There is something so compelling, so unique, so transcendent about the Bible that it demands our attention. All right, now that's a lot of talk about a reason that I'm not even counting on my list of 12. <laughs> but that's the pre-reason. I'm taking it off. I, I, I'm going to assume you take the Bible seriously, that you'll grant that it has legitimacy, then why don't we read it? Let me click off some reasons. Now go through this list fairly quickly. Why I think people don't read their Bibles so much anymore today. Number one, the busyness of life. Look, people are just busy. And a lot of times, when they hear a pastor or a group leader or something like that tell them, read your Bible, this is how it translates. Oh, great, you are giving me one more thing that I got to do every day. Don't you realize how many stuff and things I got to do every day? My day's crammed. I feel like I don't have time for anything. And you're just going to add another thing? Man, that's tough. So I think the busyness of life is a big thing. Number two, information overload. Listen, we live in such an amazing age. I mean, look, I could go on and talk about it, but you guys get it. You guys get it that you hold in your hand with your smartphone more computing power than NASA had when it sent somebody to the moon. I mean, it's just amazing to think of the power that technology and information immediately accessible, anything uh, beyond uh, ancient libraries, ancient, it's just absolute. But what it does do for us, it gives us overload. If it feels like the Bible is just one more source of information, we've already got thousands, if not millions of them. That's number two. Number three, brain Googleization. And I don't think that's a real word. I just made it up. But I think this is a big thing. Scientists say that our brains are changing because of Google. Let me explain what I think is going on there. It's not that we're losing capabilities, it's just that we're not using capabilities, and so things are changing. You know, uh, when people were much less literate and they relied much more on an oral culture where they told stories, people had remarkable memory to hear things and learn them and repeat them. Your brain still has that capability. Because I come from a generation, ancient, in regard to you, I come from a day before smartphones and all that stuff, where people actually had to memorize phone numbers. And when I was young, everybody could rattle off 20 or 30 phone numbers that they memorized. I'd be surprised if you guys could rattle off five phone numbers that you know by heart. Why? Because you're incapable of it? No, it's because you don't need to. Who needs to memorize a phone number? It's, it's just irrelevant information. But the capability is there if you would train it. Now, what does this have to do with brain Googleization? 
the search engine method of knowledge leads us to find information instantaneously, broadly, but with no depth. Now, there is a benefit to quick access to information. There's a benefit to getting broad information immediately. But there's a price to pay if we don't know in our brains how to think down through something deeply. You, as men and women who will take God and the Bible seriously, you have to resist this trend. You have to realize that you will have to engage your minds in approaching the Bible in a way that you don't engage it in other things. And, and you'll just have to say, okay, I got to come to the Bible with a different mentality, one that's willing to think deeply instead of just skate over something quickly. That was number three. Number four. Um, shaken confidence in God's word. I guess that was kind of part of my pre-reason too. But um, listen, if we have less confidence in the Bible, we're going to seek it less. Number five, multiplicity of Bible translations. I think that this is an unintended consequence of the multiplicity of Bible translations. I think that people have so many Bible translations out there that people don't get familiar with one. I wish that there could somehow be passed a moratorium in the Christian world where we say, no more Bible translations for 10 years. No more. Stop. No more. Let us just get our roots down into one that really connects with us. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole big discussion on the merits of different Bible translations, but I'll give you this quick thing. The number one qualification for a Bible translation, I'm leaving out the ones that are obviously horrible. The number one uh, qualification for a Bible translation, it's the one you'll read. But the one you'll read, stick with it. Instead of bouncing around to all these different things. Next on the list, number six. Well, it's just kind of plain, spiritual attack. Isn't it an obvious strategy of the enemy of our souls to keep us away from the Bible and meeting God in the Bible? Number seven, attractions to substitutes. I'm taking a drink of water because I'm going to step on some toes here. You need to be careful of the substitutes of the Bible. What do I mean? Well, look, I use devotional books. I love devotional books. I, I could talk to you about the devotional authors that really speak to me. I think they're good, but not as a substitute for the Bible. And there are some deliberate substitutes for the Bible out here. And here, might want to watch your feet right now, because I may step on them. Jesus Calling and books like that are bad as substitutes for the Bible. Now, I'll give you my own personal take on this. I don't, I, it would be so surprising and rare for me to tell somebody, don't read that book. Do not read that book. Because what happens when you tell somebody not to read a book? Yeah, you want to run out and read it. So I'm not telling you to not read a book like Jesus Calling. You want to read it? Read it. But this is what you should do. Every time you look at the cover, every time you open it up, you should say before and after you read it, this is not the Bible. This is not Jesus speaking to me. This is a woman's imagination about what Jesus says to her. Now, if you understand that fully, then fine. Read it or don't read it. I don't care. But I know people who would prefer to read Jesus Calling because they like it better than the Bible. That's dangerous. That's bad. I think that's an extreme example of a substitute for the Bible, but it comes in different ways as well. So I think substitutes keep people from Bible reading. Here's another one. Um, number eight, attraction to merely experiential Christianity. Now look, 
There has always been the stream in the Christian world that says, we don't need more of the Bible, we need more experience of God. There's always been that, that stream within the Christian world. So the fact that it exists today is no surprise at all. But to me, that stream is growing into a bigger and bigger river in the Christian world. That the idea is we will experience God better and more by putting away our Bibles. That's a very dangerous thought. And I'll talk more about that later. Number nine, electronic distractions. Look, we are easily distracted by our many screens, our many diversions. Number 10, inspirational preaching. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not trying to promote non-inspirational preaching, like preaching that's as depressing as possible. No, no, I'm I'm not championing that. When I say inspirational preaching, I'm talking about preaching that is merely inspirational that doesn't really give you the word of God. Because what it does is if it inspires or excites you just from kind of the atmosphere or just from the lighting or just from, you know, uh, the, the way the preacher preaches without that foundation really coming from God's word, what it teaches you is the real source of inspiration and excitement is found outside God's word. It's found in other things. Now, maybe before I get to the last couple ones, because I think that was number 10, before I get to the last couple ones, let me say, I don't think that it's any one of these that is having the effect. I think it's a culmination of a lot of different things. These are like all slender ropes that are holding down, you know, a giant. Uh, one or two of them by themselves probably couldn't do it. But you get enough of them over and with small cords you can hold down this giant. Let me tell you the last two. Um, huh. One year Bible plans. Say, well, David, how can you be against one year Bible? I'm not against one year Bible plans except when I am against them. Now, for some of you, and do not raise your hand on this because you might be a self-righteous Pharisee if you raise your hand on this. For some of you, the one-year Bible plans work beautifully. Man, it is just great. There you are every morning, your cup of herbal tea, <laughs> and you know your Bible out there, and you got your markers, and, the, and you're doing your little Instagram shots of it too, just to let everybody know what a lovely time you have in the Word. <laughs> And you got your little, you're checking off the boxes. And that, you know what, man? If that's you, praise the Lord. I got nothing to say against it, okay? Nothing. But isn't this true? For a lot of people, this is how the one year Bible plan works. First week, man, you're charging. Second week, you're behind. Third week, you are so guilt laden, you don't even want to look at your Bible. <laughs> isn't that true? How one year Bible plans work for a lot of people? So look, if it works for you, I'm not against it. But I think it's an unintended consequence of the guilt that comes into people's lives because they don't keep up with the one-year Bible reading plan that they're like, man, I don't want to, it just reminds me how far behind I am every time I crack open a Bible. And then number 12, passive robotic Bible reading. Bad Bible reading keeps us from reading our Bibles. And that's really what I'm going to talk about mostly in the last part. But here's my little post reason. I had a pre-reason and a post reason. Here's the post reason. It's connected with the last reason. Listen. If your time in the scriptures is not rewarding, how are you going to keep up with it? If you don't have any sense of reward from it, I mean, listen, if every time you cracked open the Bible and read four or five verses, you had an ecstatic experience in your heart lifting you up to the third heaven, you'd be like, man, I'm doing this all the time. I mean, it would be like, whoa, this is amazing. I can't wait to do it. Now, if your Bible reading feels rarely rewarded, you're not going to do it. 
how can you make your time in the Bible more rewarding and more effective for you? That's simply what I'm going to talk about. Before I do, though, I rattled off all these reasons why people don't read their Bibles. Can you help me out? Crowdsources for me. What other reasons are there? Has anybody got any ideas? Okay, hand over here. Yes. Oh, by the way, can somebody write these down for me and give them to me? Because I can't, I'm not going to remember after this. So, somebody there. Right, Becky, you going to help me out with this? Okay, great. Write this down. To give to, okay, please. Uh, I think it really comes down to uh, a misunderstanding of what John 15 talks about, about abiding in Jesus Christ, staying in him, what that looks like. Um, I went to a pastor's conference and uh, Ken Graves was speaking there and he, he said that pastors nowadays are afraid to preach the word of God. So um, a lot of Christian understanding is the fact that I say the sinner's prayer, I get my eternal check mark and I'm good, you know. But they don't understand that Christianity, true Christianity, is a relationship with the Lord abiding in him. So if they're not abiding in the vine, in the true source, they're not getting any substance. So you, you're saying a superficial Christian life to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. It's more okay. than actual relationship. Yeah. Like Good. It's understanding of the difference. Good. Good. I like it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. And this might be, this is kind of a positive formulation, I think, that pulls together some things you said. Yes. Just um, the, the leaving off of passing the material text of a family Bible um, down through generations that people read together. Um, so people are often their different, maybe an eat Bible completion. I know it's wonderful and accessible, but doesn't have that same gathering together and you know, you're putting your finger on something that I think we as human beings, we are wired for certain rituals. We are. And if there is something, especially in a family context, where time in the Bible can be made as a custom as a ritual in a good sense. Look, your lives are filled with good rituals. There's a coffee place that you go to a lot and you got a ritual when you go there, right? Don't you? It is. And, and there's something reassuring to you about that. Um, kind of with the scattered approach that we have, it's just like you say, there's so many other sources, but th th there's not this kind of centered thing this time, this place, with these people at this book. Yes, yeah. Well, this is why I, look, I, I'm just going to give this to you as a recommendation, as a recommendation. Try to spend more time with a paper, ink and paper Bible. Now, I'm not against the electronic thing. Look, I'm not here, oh, throw your smartphone into the sea, whatever. No, forget about that. <laughs> and look, I, 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 I'm using the iPad. I got this. Okay, I got it all. I, I, I understand. But, but there is something. What, what, one of the things I like about that, about not reading my Bible from a screen, is it tells me this is different. I want this to be different. I need to think about it differently. Now, of course, if you could train yourself to look at the screen and understand this, it's great. But for me, I need a little extra help. That's why the ink and paper Bible is helpful for me. You understand, I'm not saying there's any kind of law or superior. I'm just, just trying to talk practically. Okay, other reasons why people don't... Yes? I feel that, like, the enemy can further distract you when you're reading on an electronic device. Like, email's there. Instagram's there. For heaven's sakes, turn off your notifications if you're going to... Yes. 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 Yeah, no, that's right. Isn't it? Isn't it? That's good. Yes? For a lot of people, reading in general is not an enjoyable activity. It's hard for them. We, we're not really good readers, a lot of us, and we haven't developed that, and we didn't do really well in school. So you said bad Bible reading, but I just think for a lot of people, reading is difficult. So it's just like this chore they have to do then to hear God's voice. Okay, now, can I push back on that a little bit? Don't people read more than ever now? I mean, they, they read, listen, uh, you know, 
all you, all you guys read Harry Potter books when you were kids, and everybody thought you wouldn't read those, right? People reading those silly novels, Fifty Shades of Grey and stuff like those were huge sellers. Uh, Drek comes out all the time, and that's not the title of a book, that's a description in general. Uh, and people read that. People are reading texts, and they, they're reading in different ways, but they're reading like crazy. But the ability to read well, I think, is like being lost. That's what we have to push against. If you read your Bible poorly, don't be surprised that you don't get anything out of it. Yes, another hand. Uh, do you think that's bad? Okay, what I'm going to argue with, with is that there's a place for both. Yeah, the audio Bible thing is okay. It's good. I, nothing against that. But I, I think there's a place for both. But I think if, you would, if you're listening to an audio book, how much are you actually concentrating on that audio book? I mean, I hear every now and then people, oh, I, I get this audio book, I, I'm listening to the audio book when I'm driving to work. But do, I mean... Okay, well, help me out here. Uh, if, I, yeah. Well, maybe you're concentrating on the book and you're a really bad driver. That could be a possible too. <laughs> okay, help me out on this. If, if reading in a regular book, if my comprehension level there is 10, let's just say, for the sake of argument, if that's 10, what is my comprehension level on an audio book? Do, do you understand the, the analogy I'm trying to draw here? What would it be? What would it be? Okay, no, if, if reading, if my reading comprehension on a book is at the level of a 10, how much less is it if I'm doing an audio book? What do you think? Uh, it would depend if you're an audio learner or... Yeah, people are different, aren't they? Okay, for you, what would it be? Okay, seven. What? Half? Five? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Red shirt. Yeah, well, I actually just have a question because how does that not contradict the fact that with the whole listening to preacher, nominal, like if we're talking about listening to the Bible, how does that not contradict that it's an issue to think? You know, well, no, no, the, the, we're, we're not trying to say listening is bad. We're just saying, does it replace reading? No, so I, I'm not making it either or. I, I, I'm saying it should be a both and. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm just like, I, for me, I would say five, but just like, you're not controlling the pace, right? Right. And, and I think that's the case for me. Yeah. That's true. Yes, back there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's good. Okay. Any other ways? We, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I want to talk to you for the rest of the time here about how I believe you can read the Bible better and do what I call meet Jesus in his word. This is an idea, a concept that's super meaningful to me. Because look, um, I, I have no idea how many hours of my life I've given to studying the Bible. I mean, it's a lot. A lot. I've been teaching the Bible for 40 years. I turned 56 this year, and when I was 16, I still don't know why he did it, but a pastor of a little Calvary Chapel I was going to, the guy asked me if I wanted to start teaching a home Bible study. At first, I thought it was because he thought I was like 
oh, maybe he saw this aura of like, oh, he's so spiritual or look at the anointing. I found out later that it was just because it was in another community and he had been teaching that home Bible study and he didn't want to make the drive every week anymore. <laughs> but here's a 16-year-old kid who was on fire for Jesus and he had a car. So, man, do you want to do it? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. So when I was 16, I started, and I can say pretty much, I, I, it has been rare to have a month go by since I was 16 that I haven't prepared and taught the Bible. That's not to mention all the other kind of study that I've done. It's not to mention all just the personal devotional reading I've done of the Bible. Now, why? What makes it meaningful? Listen. It's not just that I can talk about the Bible. It's not just so that I can win a Bible trivia contest, which I might not win anyway. I'll tell you what the most meaningful thing to me about my time in the Bible is. Is I meet with God in his word. It's a place where I connect with God. Where he connects with me. And I want you to listen to me carefully on this. It's not the only place where I experience God. Not at all. But I have not had any deeper experience with God other than what I've had in his word. Now, I have had tremendously deep experiences with God. And I'm talking on an experiential level. I'm talking goosebumps. I'm talking about takes your breath away a little bit. I'm talking about, you know, sometimes an overwhelming sense. I'm talking about experience here. I've had those kind of experiences in times of worship. Maybe you have too. I've had those kind of experiences in times of prayer, in prayer meetings. Perhaps you have too. I've had those kind of experiences sometimes in the midst of Christian service, when I'm out on the line doing something for the Lord. Maybe you have too. But I've never had greater experiences, you could say equal, but I've never had greater experiences than I've had together with the Lord, thinking about, meditating on, going deep in his word. And this is what I understand. I understand it's not that way for everybody. That video that we saw at the beginning, I was really touched by it, but I was wondering about that video. I was wondering about when he talked about how rewarding his experience with the Bible became and how God led him to that. I was wondering how many of you were thinking, well, yeah, it's great for you. Doesn't work that way for me. I, wanna, I, I thought there's probably more than a handful of people in here. It's like, yeah, I'm waiting for that to happen for me. The Bible doesn't connect with, listen, I'm here to tell you, God wants to meet you in his word. And there's things that you can do to better read and approach the Bible that'll help you with this. And this is number one on the list. Number one on the list is realize that what you're talking about is a spiritual dynamic. It's not just an intellectual one. Now, there is an intellectual and academic aspect of this. Brian's word, we're well spoken. If we knew how to read better, period, we'd read our Bibles better. But it's not only an intellectual or an academic exercise. This is something spiritual. And the idea that something spiritual leads me to two very practical points. Number one, our obedience or rebellion against God is going to make a difference in this. Man, I I hate to just be so, you know, like, ah, here it is. (laughs) But if your life is lived in conscious rebellion against God and you wonder why your Bible reading time is so dry, there's a spiritual dynamic going on there. And it's like this, it's like this. Oh, just speak to me, Lord, please. Would you speak to me? I mean, you you are in conscious, deliberate rebellion against God in one or more areas. And, And I'm not talking about that place where you're struggling with something. We all struggle. I'm talking that goes a little bit beyond the area of struggle. And you're just saying, okay, God, we just understand. I'm gonna do this and you're gonna think it's okay so we're all right with that. If you're in that conscious rebellion... You're forgetting that this is a spiritual dynamic at work. And therefore, 
our submission to God or lack of submission to God is going to make a difference with this. So that's one thing you got to keep in mind. The second thing about this being a spiritual dynamic is, is you need to remember that prayer matters. Ask God to reveal himself to you in and through the word. Pray. I'm not saying you have to pray for an hour before you read your Bible. Honestly, you might think I'm unspiritual for how quickly I pray before. Lord, speak to me now through your word. Thank you, Lord. But I mean, I'm recognizing in that, that it's not just about me reading it. It's about God revealing himself to me. But you have to understand this is a spiritual dynamic at work here. It's not just an academic thing. Therefore, my submission or lack of it matters and prayer beforehand matters. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing comes back to this. Let me give you some practical things you can do to read the Bible better. I'm going to give you one recommendation that when I was young, it changed my life in reading the Bible. And I can't even remember where I got this. I, I want to say I thought of it on my own because I don't remember anybody telling me, but it could be that somebody told me to do this and I just forgot about it. But because I think it's good, let's just say that I thought of it on my own. <laughs> Read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to be on a plan. Take the plan if you want it. Don't take it if you don't. Read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and have a journal. A journal where you write, not just entering in on a keypad. And this is what you need to do. Are you listening? Write a one-sentence summary of every chapter of the Bible. I've got two or three of those notebooks in my life. And when I look back, I can't tell you the feeling of just, this is something awesome. Read through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and write a one-sentence summary of every chapter. You know what it'll do? It'll make you read the Bible and think about what it says. That's a novel idea. Do, do you realize how much of our reading of the Bible is just done in drone mode? Isn't it amazing? It's startling. And when you read your Bible in drone mode, you're not going to get much out of it. But if you read it thoughtfully thinking, okay, I'm just going to write a one-sentence summary of this chapter. You will read it paying attention and it'll do something remarkable in your life. That, that it might be the single best practical piece of advice I'm going to give you. Let me go on to a second one. Number two, read the Bible and pray with the words and the ideas that you read in the text. Pray from your Bible reading. So let's say you're going to begin with uh, Genesis chapter 1. What happens in Genesis chapter 1? Creation. How does Genesis chapter 1 begin? Can somebody just say it? I'm glad somebody knows it because my three-year-old grandson has memorized that verse, so I'd be disappointed if nobody here had. Okay, now, do you, do you realize how you can make a prayer out of that verse? If you think about it, Lord, you created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning. I need you to do a work of creation in my life a new work of creation. Lord, what do you need to create in my life? Lord, I give you authority as creator. I recognize you as creator in my life. Thank you, Lord, for creating. Do you see how you could pray for actually a long time? Just from Genesis 1-1. But again, what it does is it gets you to think about the words and what they mean and how it applies to your life. And suddenly, in a beautiful, powerful way, God is meeting me in his word. 
I started reading Genesis 1-1 and thinking about it, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm connecting with God as creator in a powerful way. It's not, you know, rocket science. It's not something left up there to mystics. It's not something left up there to, to scholars. It's for us, every one of us, in the daily course of life. So that's number two. Pray from the words and the ideas of the portion that you read. Number three, read the Bible out loud. Now, I'm not saying you have to do every, you say, okay, this is my daily Bible reading. First, I got to write the thing, then I got to pray. No, I, I'm giving you a variety of suggestions that you can implement one here, one there, just as you please. But here's just another piece of the puzzle. Read the Bible out loud. Did you know that that was the practice of reading in the ancient world? In Bible times, when people read, they read out loud. That's why the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is that, Romans 11, 7, 17, something like that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Because when you would read the Bible in those days, you'd also hear it. But again, what does reading out loud do? It makes you stop and think more about the words, or it gives you the opportunity to do so. Number four, uh, as a supplement, use audio Bibles. I'm not against the audio Bible. I just wouldn't let it eliminate your time with the text, with the paper and ink. Number five, Read a different good translation if your Bible reading seems stale. Now, you might say, well, David, you're contradicting yourself. Before you said a multiplicity of Bible translations. Listen, I'm not telling you to go a revolving door and read 12 different Bible translations on 12 different days. But if your Bible reading seems stale, use a different translation. The, the Bible translation I mostly use and is the New King James Version. Uh, there's several reasons why I prefer that. You can ask me about it later if you want. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but when I want to mix it up, I'll read the New Living Translation. I'll read the J.B. Phillips Translation, which is an old one from like the 50s and 60s. But man, there, there's, there's, there's good stuff there. Again, just, just as a different routine. Um, Next, number seven, read in community. Get some friends together and just read the Bible out loud together. Don't comment on it much. You know, not a Bible study. We're going to get together and read the Bible together. Wouldn't that be awesome? Everybody just sit around. We're just going to read our Bibles together. How sweet, how beautiful. Number eight, make it a priority to find time to read the Bible. Look, you, th that's all it is to it. We just got to put some priority on it if we're going to prize it. And then number nine, don't be afraid to use some good surveys, introductions, and commentaries on the Bible. Uh, listen, I, there's people that use my Bible commentary as part of their daily Bible reading. They just, it helps them. But there's tons of resources out there. Don't, don't be afraid to use them from time to time. They can be helpful. Now, where are we at at time here? All right, we still got a little more time. Um, yeah, I didn't change my watch. I, I got it at only being 10 to 7 right now, so we're doing great. Um, is it almost 10 o'clock? Oh, I, that's right. I changed, my, I changed my watch in Denver, so it's only two hours difference. Okay. Before I end with another short list, I'm going to end with another. I'm giving you like three or four lists tonight. Before I end with another short list, and the, the, the last list I'm going to give you is bad ways to read your Bible. Um, what more do you guys have on helpful ways to meet God in his word. Help me out here. What's been your experience? 
Way at the back. Learning to be still. What does that mean? Okay. Sit and be quiet. Are you talking about in terms of meditation on the word? Or, or, just, or just, just going blank? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, even, I mean, just physically. You know, there's something to... Look, I, I'm happy for people to read the Bible whenever they can. On the go, as it were. But don't miss the value of just sitting down and putting your attention purely on the text. I mean, seriously, even if it was for only 10 minutes, it would be of great value. Tremendous value. Okay, what more? Yes, over here. Memorizing. Uh, have you found any kind of thing effective in Bible memorization? Well, whatever. Yeah. What I would do to help myself memorize certain passages of scriptures is uh, I would write down a verse uh, on a three by five card or a little card uh, in the morning in my, in my devotional time. And then I would just keep that card with me all throughout the day. And I would just take it out and look at it and memorize it and do it again. And then usually by the end of the day, I'd memorized it. But things like that, this is really helpful. Although, I would say this, memorization with a view to meditation. Um, to give an extreme example of the opposite, there are many Muslims who have memorized large portions of the Quran, but it's entirely by rote. It's entirely just by the sounds it makes. It's like their, their minds are on automatic pilot when it comes to what the words actually mean. So memorization is amazing, but memorization with a view to meditation upon it. Yes, hand right here. Turning verses into songs. That's beautiful. I'm sorry, different, different words, oh, keying on different words in the verse. Okay, okay. Yes, absolutely. Again, that's part of it. It's just deciding that you're going to read not in drone mode. Yes. Okay, so getting off social media has been very helpful for you in that. Yeah, it's, yeah. It gives you a lot of Do, does social media take a lot of time in people's lives? Yeah? All right. Raise your hand if you are active on more than one social media platform. More than two. All right. Okay. Just... Curiosity for me. Okay. Was there another one over here? Yes. Yes. That's right. With a conscious sense, I'm going to get something for my day and take it with me through the day. Good. Back here. Yeah. 
yeah, like, like you got to check a box and do so much. I, I, again, I'm throwing a lot of things out there and I think different things will connect with you at different times and different seasons in your walk with God. But let me tell you one approach to Bible reading that's been beneficial for me is to read until God speaks to me about something and then not reading further. Whoa, okay, God's speaking to me about this. All right, let, let's, let's drill down on this. And so I, it's not like, okay, I have to read three chapters today. A after the first half chapter, God was really speaking to me about something. Okay, well, I'm just gonna stop here and let him speak. Lord, what do you have to show me about this? What are you dealing with this in my life? But then sometimes if I'm reading and I'm not feeling like the Lord's speaking, then either um, I should keep reading or reassess how I'm reading. But no, I, I like that. Sometimes we just try to read too much. Yes, right here. Yeah. So like just like going through it with your friends and saying, we're gonna study this book together, we like got a study plan together, and we were all in the same place of life just entering college and it was doing it together, doing it in community. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, yes, back here. Yes. Yes. Very good. Over here, yes. Um, true understanding of God's calling on our life as being true disciples of this. You know, what was the command that he gave the disciples? This is what helped me the most was, was wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit power, you know, power-wise. Because he also <clears> said that you are clean by the words that I've spoken to you. So they were already believers at that point. But the power of the Holy Spirit, but what are we called to do as disciples of Jesus? Christ is to go into all the world and share the gospel. Yeah. So you can't do that without knowing who God is. Yeah. This understanding my calling is what helped me understand uh, what is what helped me study God's word. Yes. And, and again, that's why I'd really want to emphasize this idea. You got to begin by understanding this is a spiritual exercise. It's a spiritual thing that's working on. All right, I'm going to try to get an order done. Back here. Write it out in longhand. Yep, we retain a lot that way, don't we? Although my, uh, my cursive is really lame. Is block okay, letters okay? <laughs> all right, all right, good. Uh, right here first. Yes, I Dan. Switch to a reader's Bible in the morning because of the chapter break always confused me. The moment I okay, explain to everybody what a reader's Bible is. Reader's Bible. Isn't every Bible a reader's Bible? <laughs> no, yeah. Are you using a, like a Braille one otherwise? <laughs> So it doesn't have chapter breaks or verses, so I can read through and not just stop and I actually see pieces connecting that never connected. Yeah. Do you have it like on that artisan paper and all that stuff? Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. No, I feel you. I got that too. I got that too. All right. Um, back here, yes. I I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yes, less of a concern about the environment around you? Yes. Yeah, being able to focus upon what you're doing right there. Now look, this is part of a disadvantage for you all. You all are growing up in a mental environment where focus isn't important. Because you can touch on something and move to something else and, you know, you just kind of move from thing to thing real quick. Now look, I, I'm not speaking ill of that. There's some advantage, there's some pluses to that. But what it says is, again, you're going to have to readjust your mentality when you open up that book and say, focus, shut out everything else here. I'm going to drill deep down now. And, and you know what, I'm just going to say, you can do it. You can do it. You can live in the midst of the culture that says you don't have to focus on anything and say, no, I am going to focus on this and God will meet you in his word. Yes? I couldn't hear it. I don't know if she said it, but just putting your phone somewhere else away from you. Did yeah. you say that? Yeah. Well, not exactly, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the environment. Physically getting it away because even if it's not buzzing, I bet I'll get tempted to like type eagles into Google or something. Like seriously, like right in the middle of my Bible reading. So like to physically put it away from me 
So that even if I start to go for it, oh, it's not there. I went over to a guy's house and he had this little box. I mean, it looked like a like an ice cream maker or something almost, but it had a lid on it. And you put something in there and you punch in the numbers and it will not open for however long you tell it to. So when he was doing his Bible study time, he would put it in there and he could not get to his phone for the next, you know, half hour, whatever it was that he punched in there. And I thought, man, that's pretty hardcore, but yeah, that, that's a, it's like a safe, you know, that you can't crack. All right, we'll just take a couple more. Back there, yes. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. Did you guys hear what she said? Basically, what she said is our preconceived notions. I'm going to mention that in the last list that I give in just a minute. But the preconceived notions that you have are like, well, oh, yeah, I know what this is all about. Look, look, how easy for you is it for you to come to 1 Samuel chapter, what is it, 17? David and Goliath? Um, to come to 1 Samuel 17, oh, I know this story. And you don't even read it. You're just on drone mode throughout the whole thing. You say, oh yeah, I, I got this. Yeah, you, you got to discipline yourself. For it. One more. One more. Yes, sir. One thing I found very helpful is waking up like before the rest of the world wakes up. So, and also, you know, that we're very comfortable in our world. We're so blessed to have freedom to read our world wherever we are. But it's so cool to discipline yourself. Like, you have to be a little uncomfortable here and wake up. Even if I only slept six hours, I wake up at 5 a.m. Oh, you're a morning person, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, I am too. Okay, so like you're like speaking my love language right there. It's like there's nothing like that in the morning. But like my wife, I mean, if she were to do that, talk about drone mode. She, you know, it's like that. No, if, she, if my wife, if she's going to have a meaningful time, it has to be later in the day. Otherwise, you know, it's just not together yet for her. So... Yeah. No, but I would say this. Do that. Find out when you're sharp and do it then, if you can. Yeah. All right. Let me go through this because, look, I know it's not like we're constrained by time, but I, I want to go through this quick list and then give you. These are how to read the Bible ineffectively. Here's nine ways to read the Bible ineffectively. Ready? Number one, speed reading. I don't know if you guys have been trained in speed reading techniques. I think they're kind of awesome, you know, that, and there's a lot to it. But not with your Bible. You know, again, it's just like, uh, no. Forget about the speed reading. You're here to focus in. Number two, know-it-all reading. That's what the, your woman back here was talking about, the preconceived notions. You know what it is, blah, 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 this and that. Listen. I have been studying the Bible intently for 40 years, and it still surprises me all the time. Isn't that amazing? I got to say, I regard that as a mark of divine inspiration. There are not many things that can hold my interest for that long. I mean, I can only think of two of them. The Bible and my wife. I'm the kind of guy who you take me to an amazing place of scenery. You know, I, there I am in the Alps, you know, looking around and like, it is staggering. It's amazing. And I look at it for about 10 minutes. I go, all right, man, great, good. What, what's next? You know, because look, I saw it. There it is. I mean, okay, how, how long am I supposed to look at that? I saw it. It's cool. Let's move on. <laughs> that that kind of shows the, the ADD that's within me. But I tell you this, the Bible continues to just absolutely keep my entrance. I, I, again, so um, you need to put away those preconceived notions. If you like to mark up your Bible, I think that's awesome, but you might want to do your Bible reading in a Bible you haven't marked up yet. Okay, number three, fortune cookie reading. What's fortune cookie reading? It's where you open up the book and just go, mm, mm. And what you do is you just treat the Bible like it's a collection of fortune cookies. Man, listen, there is a book of fortune cookies in the Bible. What do we call it? Proverbs. 
Other than that, everything has a context. And actually, there's some sections of Proverbs that have context, but anyway. Read it in its context. Get it. And I'm not saying that God can't surprise you with a boom verse every once in a while, for sure. But your general reading, stay away from just like, oh, this and this. And no, really read stuff in context. Number four, magic eight ball reading. You guys know what the magic, am I dating myself with the magic? Do you guys know what the magic eight ball is? Yeah? Has anybody actually seen a magic eight ball or you just, you just know about it? They're awesome if you've ever seen one. Um, but the magic eight ball is a thing you look to for guidance, right? And so, really, you're just reading the Bible like it's a Ouija board. Like, okay, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Uh, should I go after this girl or not? Should I go after this girl? Okay, I'm going to read, you know, Leviticus chapter 4. Is this the one for me or not? You know, it's all about sacrificing a goat or something. You're like, I don't know it, Lord. What is it? Listen, don't, don't come like demanding to know some specific thing from God in guidance for your life. Draw near to him and he'll guide you. That's it, just draw near to him and he'll guide you. Stay away from the magic eight ball reading. Number five, absent-minded reading. Or you could call that eyeball reading. I, I've been referring to that as drone mode. Just, I, isn't it humbling how you can read your Bible and then five minutes later you ask yourself, what did I read? And you have, I have no idea what I just read. Come on, that's not just me, is it? Okay, but, but really, if we're doing that, I, again, I'm not, I hope you sense, there's not the slightest bit of condemnation here. But what I'm saying is, if I'm doing that, should I be surprised that my Bible reading feels unrewarding? It's just, okay, well, no wonder. I'm reading it like that. Okay, next, um, Da Vinci Code reading. You're looking for those deep, hidden mysteries that nobody has ever seen before in the text. You know, you're drawing this and this and this, and it looks like the wall of a conspiracy theory guy with threads all over the place going, this. you know what? Look for the clear, simple meaning of the text. I tell people who are preachers and teachers, I say this, don't try to be profound. Don't try to be eloquent. Try to be simple and clear. And sometimes there's an eloquence that comes from simplicity and clarity. But just try to be simple and clear. Same thing in our Bible reading. Number seven, checklist reading. You know, that, that's often connected with the one-year Bible plan. You're just doing it to get your checklist. Doing it to get your checklist, that's it. Forget about that. And then finally, number eight, casting agent reading. What do I mean by that? I'm using the metaphor of a film or a play. And you're reading like the casting agent, and you're trying to cast yourself into every role in the Bible. Especially the hero of the role. Can I tell you that the Bible has a hero in its story and you're not it? Now, I'm not saying you're not in the Bible. Oh, you're in there. You're just not the hero. Um, you're the one who needs help. You're the one that God draws near to. We're the ones that God rescues. We're the ones that he lifts up. We're that. But Jesus is the hero of the Bible's story. And we always read it with that in mind. So don't read it like the casting agent looking to cast yourself into the hero role every time. Look for it for where it tells you where Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in your life. Look, I, I believe that God comes to us in and through his word. I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. I am not trying to say for a moment that it is the only way that God comes to us. I believe God comes to us in prayer. I believe God comes to us in worship. I believe God comes to us in the community of his people. I believe God comes to us in serving him. I believe all those things. But I also believe, and for me, my life has been profoundly nourished by the connection, the fellowship, the meeting I have with God in and through his word. I want that for you. 
I want you to know what it is to connect with God in and through his word. I think some of the practical things we've talked about tonight will help you with that. Tomorrow, the first session, I'm going to talk about something. It'll be a little more like a regular Bible study tomorrow. But I still want to keep it very discussion-oriented. I want to talk to you about something that I think is so profound and important. I talked about identity. And that's, uh, that's tomorrow. Any more comments or questions upon tonight? Yes. Yes. Yeah. One proverb or a chapter? Yeah. Yeah, you, you match it up with the day of the month. Yeah. Yeah, that's an awesome way to do it. I'll tell you guys, look, I, I read the whole Bible, study the whole Bible, um, but I spend most my devotional time in the Psalms. There is something so profound and deep and connecting with me in and through the Psalms. I find such nourishment for my soul in that.